Good morning and welcome to Worcester Community Church. Um, this has been a bit of a rough week for our community as we've had uh, COVID cases increasing pretty significantly and a number of businesses have had to close because of exposures and uh, I know that a lot of people are really worried right now and um, that's for good reason. Um, a lot of people's livelihoods are looking to be uncertain. Um, people's health is in jeopardy. Um, our healthcare system is strained and so I want to begin our service today <clears throat> by praying for the situation, excuse me. And uh, so let's, let's do that. Heavenly Father, um, I just thank you that you are on your throne and you are in control and you know our needs and you know all the pressures and all the strains uh, <clears throat> each one of us are facing right now. We pray for our community. We pray that um, your goodness and your mercy would be known here, Lord. We pray that you would have mercy on on this town and uh, Lord we know that you work all things together uh, for good and so we pray Lord that you would use this situation to reveal your kindness and your love and uh, we lift up our leaders we lay up, lift up Mayor Jack Crompton we lift up uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry and our Premier John Horgan we lift up uh, Dr. Teresa Tam and Justin Trudeau Lord as as they are leading our, our government through these, these times. And we pray, Lord, that as your people, even though our rights are restricted, even though our lives are interrupted, um, we would seek the good of, of our community and our country and not uh, be so preoccupied with our own, our own needs right now, but uh, always ready to make the most of every opportunity to serve and to love others. We ask that you'd be honored and glorified in our service today and in our lives and in our relationships and in every moment. In Jesus' name, amen. This uh, Sunday, we're going to be um, continuing our, our discussion about sexuality. That is one of the big issues for a lot of people when it comes to even entertaining the thought of believing the gospel. So we want to develop that further. We're also going to have communion together today. It's one of those things where I would much rather celebrate communion in person. That is really at the heart of, of communion is that we, we do this in fellowship with the Lord and we also do this in fellowship with other, others. And so I, the reason we haven't done it frequently over the last while is because I would always want that to be something we do the first Sunday back. But we, we see now that that first Sunday back uh, gets pushed further and further away. And right now it's it's totally unknown so we are going to celebrate communion today so I hope that you have some kind of grape juice or wine available and uh, some kind of bread so that we can do that and if not hit pause go to the pantry find what you can find and we'll do that after uh, Steve and Esther lead us in a time of worship we're also uh, I, I'm really counting on the fact that I'm gonna be able to get a a video update video together so uh, if it's if I did get it done it's gonna come right after this bit and if I didn't get it done I promise I'll get it done very soon but um, yeah things are are crazy right now um, the other thing I want to let you know about is that March 1st we are going to have our AGM it is going to be done online and I know that that's no fun but um, you know what, this is a really exciting year for our church. As, as crazy as all the pandemic stuff has been, we are going to have a new building before the year is out. Uh, Lord willing, another pastor. Um, this is going to be such a huge time of, of positive change for our church, really unprecedented. So, you know what, I think it'll be actually really encouraging. And um, so please mark your calendars for March 1st. We're going to be working on getting an information package out to in the next couple of weeks, including our budget. And uh, on that note, I just want to say thank you um, for every one of you that did give and help us make our um, meet our expenses this past year. We didn't make our the our budget figure for 2020, but to be honest, that number that target didn't reflect the reality that we lived last year. And, and you all know that. But uh, by the grace of God, 
our bills were paid. Um, and so I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness in doing that. Welcome to the latest update from the church building site. It's the end of January and we've uh, had one month since the last update. A lot of work's been going on inside the building uh, as it's quite snowy here outside. Uh, you'll see in the footage uh, we've installed a lot of the mechanical systems, the HRV system um, for the heating recovery, a lot of the ducting for the air conditioning and the heating systems. Uh, we've also now started you know, the framing in around all those uh, pipes to allow us to get ready for drywall coming along in the future. Uh, the electricians have started uh, with their rough in and uh, starting to get all the wiring for all our uh, electrical systems. Uh, and we're also working on some of the internal framing areas that uh, we hadn't completed before, such as uh, the storage area behind the stage um, uh, within the main sanctuary, uh, framing up around uh, the window where the cross will be above the uh, sanctuary and uh, we'll be moving uh, during the coming weeks to actually building the stage area and finishing the last of the you know, internal framing work. So uh, thanks for uh, all the support uh, come the end of uh, last year. We did receive a bit over $200,000 worth of donations in December. Uh, so thank you everyone who supported. Uh, I still do ask for additional prayer and support as we move into this year, as we continue to have expenses. And um, I ask that you just keep uh, thinking about this project, praying for the people working here, and um, we look forward to hearing more in the next updates. Thanks. Mr. Church, it's good to have you with us. Today, yeah, I was feeling really cozy and it reminded me of being around a fire with some friends playing guitar. So I picked up my little campfire guitar, I guess. And yeah, it's just good to think that we're all together and yeah, we can worship our Lord together. So let's, let's worship.
scripture is from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 47 to 58. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I offer so the world may live, is my flesh. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How could this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of son of man, and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die, as your ancestors did, even though they ate manna, but will live forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we're going to celebrate communion together, and uh, this is uh, something that we do to remember Jesus' death, and um, this passage that Natalia just read is it happens in the Gospel of John right after Jesus has fed the 5,000 and all these people want to follow him because they think that what they're going to get for him is more free bread and he keeps telling them no you don't understand what you don't what you need is not bread you need what only I can give you I am actually the, the, the true bread from heaven I am what is going to sustain your life through eternity and so he's pointing forward to the cross where he will lay down his life. His body will be broken and his blood will be shed so that we can have eternal life. So today, as we celebrate communion, we receive the bread and we receive the cup in remembrance of his sacrifice for us. I'm going to pray now and, uh, and then we'll, we'll do this together. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the hope of eternal life that you've provided us, not just with our daily needs, but you've provided for our eternal needs by sending Jesus into the world to go to the cross so that we can be made whole, so that we can be redeemed and brought to peace with you. And so we receive this in thanksgiving. We receive this as the body of Christ uh, ourselves, as your church, recognizing that even though we're physically not together uh, today, we are one. We belong to you and we belong to each other. In Jesus' name, amen. So from home, uh, peel, please feel free to grab a, a cracker and some juice. You can, you can pause it if you like. Um, but let's, let's do this together. So Jesus took the bread at the Last Supper and he broke it. And he said, this, it, this bread is my body broken for you. And then after dinner, he took the cup and he said, this cup is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Thanks for participating with us today. I hope we can do this together in person one day soon. I don't know how, when that will be, but in the meantime, um, I just want to remind you that we are, we, we are one body. We do belong to each other. We're here to support one another. If there's any way that we can pray for you, anything that we can do to help in a practical way, um, we're here for you and we're here for each other. Welcome back. So this month we've been talking about some of the most pressing challenges facing the, the church and, and facing people as they contemplate believing the gospel. And I would have to say right at, at the top of, of that uh, list of, of issues is the issue of sexuality. 
So today we're going to look at some of the issues of how we interpret scripture as it relates to this question. But I, I want to begin by reiterating something uh, I said a few weeks ago. And, and that is that our posture in this is not that we are uh, morally superior to people who feel same-sex attraction. Our, our purpose in talking about this issue is not to say, hey, look at those, those sinners, right? Uh, our purpose in this is to uh, point people to Jesus. Uh, we talk about these issues of sexuality because we believe that the way of Jesus is the best thing for every single human being there is regardless of what it is they how it is they're tempted or what it is they feel there is nothing better for a human being than to be reconciled to the god that made them and so that is why we are having this conversation to show people the goodness and the love of god so everything we are going to say today needs to be grounded in that truth if you didn't see the message from two weeks ago and three weeks ago, I really encourage you to go back and watch those messages because that really sets us up for what we're going to talk about today. So today we are going to look at a specific question related to sexuality in the Bible. And the question is this, is the church's rejection of homosexuality actually biblical or really biblical? Now, Obviously, there are a lot of people who would say that for a person to say that homosexuality is not acceptable, that's hateful and wrong, and they reject it, and they reject Christianity because of it. Uh, and then there's other, uh, another religion that called liberal Christianity that says, no, we, we should embrace homosexuality, um, but they don't say that because they believe the Bible embraces it, but they, they believe that because they believe they've evolved beyond seeing the Bible as an authority. It's a, the Bible to them is an account of a past culture's experience of searching for God, but it's not God truly revealing himself. Um, but the, this question doesn't come from either of those two groups. This question comes from a group of people uh, who by and large grew up in conservative Christian homes and who uh, believe that the Bible is their authority. They believe the Bible is the word of God. Um, but as they've wrestled with their own identity and their own attractions, they have questioned whether or not the Bible truly forbids homosexual relationships. And so authors like, like Matthew Vines and others have claimed that the Bible doesn't in fact condemn committed monogamous relationships between people of the same sex. And so he challenges his readers, these books challenge their readers to imagine what is it, what, what would be the implications if we had had this thing wrong the whole time? Just imagine what it could do for the church if we went back to the Bible and really read it on its own terms and discovered that no, there is nothing wrong with a homosexual relationship if it is a covenant committed relationship between equals. And, and so this is what he writes. In his book, Matthew Vines writes, the fiercest objections to LGBT equality, those based on religious beliefs, can begin to fall away. The tremendous pain endured by LGBT youth in many Christian homes can become a relic of the past. Christianity's reputation in much of the Western world can begin to rebound. Together we can reclaim our light. I mean, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Like, I don't take any joy in causing anyone distress. And, and you know what? I really don't take any joy in being a pariah in a community that really celebrates uh, homosexual relationships. I mean... This is, I think this is Pride Week, right? You see the flags out there. I don't enjoy being the guy who sees those and says, this community isn't for me, right? So why is it that we shouldn't just move on, right? Why shouldn't we just get with the program when it seems like it would just be a win for everybody to move on and embrace homosexuality as acceptable? Here's why. 
if God's intention for human sexuality is truly one man and one woman, and we decide to interpret a meaning into scripture that God didn't intend, this is not just interpreting differently, right? If we do that, we are actually willfully rebelling against God. We are twisting his words and we are leading other people to do the same. And even though we might get to tell people what will make them feel better, um, even though culture and, and society and our community will pat us on the back for it, we will be leading people astray. And before we ever consider allowing our cultural framework or our personal preferences to define what the scripture means, we need to hear this warning from the mouth of Jesus very clearly. Jesus says in Matthew 18, verse six, but if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? These are the stakes in this discussion. If Matthew Vines is right, then for 20 centuries, the church has universally misunderstood God's intention for human sexuality. We've needlessly brought pain and rejection to people who are attracted to their own sex. And you know what? If, if he's right, then we should repent immediately. But if Matthew Vines is wrong, if we choose to say something other than what God said, woe to us. We will be guilty of encouraging and affirming people toward their own destruction. So, ultimately, what we would like to be the case or what we would prefer or what's convenient for us that can't factor into interpretation. Ultimately, we have to simply understood, understand what God has said in his word on its own terms and then allow our morality and our ethics to be shaped by his will, not our own preferences. So, Let's start looking at some of the texts. And first we'll look at the Old Testament. One of the key places where we see discussion of, of homosexuality is in the book of Leviticus, in the Law of Moses. Leviticus 18.22 gives this law. You must not have sexual intercourse with a male as one has sexual intercourse with a woman. It is a detestable act. Leviticus 20 verse 13. If a man has sexual intercourse with a male, as one has sexual intercourse with a woman, two of them have committed an abomination. They must be put to death and their blood guilt is on themselves. So what do we do with these verses? And first of all, I need to say that these verses are not telling us right now that we should be putting people to death. Um, when we read the Old Testament law, there are you know over 36 different capital offenses, offenses that call for the death penalty, uh, including adultery and false prophecy and necromancy and, and blasphemy. Um, but they, those are not for us to act on, uh, to bring judgment on. Like, and, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but there are also a number of other offenses or things that are labeled as abominations in the Old Testament, including eating non-kosher food, including wearing clothing mixed of, of wool and cotton, uh, sitting where a menstruating woman has sat. Now, you will notice that uh, many Christians eat bacon 
and we wear textiles uh, that are mixed and we honestly do not make it our business to know who has sat where and when. So that raises the question, why is it that we uh, Christians do not apply the Old Testament laws uniformly? And here is the challenge, right? This is the challenge as it relates to uh, sexuality. Do we just pick and choose what suits us? What makes sense to us? What seems right to our own eyes? If we are, all, if we are already choosing to not follow certain Old Testament laws, why would we follow the laws that say that homosexual acts are wrong? And this is a, a charge that has been leveled against conservative Christians from people like Matthew Vines and, and even theologians like Luke Timothy Johnson. And honestly, the, the, the temptation to choose to obey certain parts of scripture and not obey other parts, that temptation is always there, but that is a temptation that the Bible constantly challenges us to resist and reject. Um, but there's another, but there is a good reason why there are certain laws that we don't follow. And it's because there are three different categories of law and each of them applies to our situation in different ways. So the first category of law is the moral law. So these are laws that are fundamentally about what is right and what is wrong. These are laws that reflect God's character and God's heart and God's intention for humanity so that we will uh, in, experience the, the highest level of flourishing in our existence. These are laws like the command to love, your Lord, lo, lo, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. This is in the Old Testament. This is in the law of Moses, but this is just as relevant for us now as it was then. There is never going to be a time when these laws are not in force. Then, so that's the moral law. Second, there are ceremonial laws. And these are laws that regulated temple worship in, in the Old Testament. These are laws that are about being clean, but not in a hygienic sense, but in a, 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 a holiness sense. These ceremonial laws um, gave the Israelites very tangible ways of remembering that they were to be a people set apart for God. So they were to be different from the other nations that followed after false gods. They were to be visibly and tangibly different. So hence, their clothing had to be different. They had to do all kinds of things that kept that separation very visible from other nations. There, there are also ceremonial laws that um, make it very tangible uh, for them to remember that they are sinners in the presence of God and that you can't approach God unless you have been made clean. And so they had to have ritual baths and they had to keep from contact with all sorts of unclean things. And so this is why they had to do all these different seemingly arbitrary things that didn't have any moral component to them, didn't have any practical benefit to them. But these laws were given to show that this was a people living under the authority of God who belonged to him. Then there's the third category of law, which is civil law. So these laws governed how the nation of Israel operated as a state, much the same way that our laws in Canada govern our lives and activities, you know, issues of possession. And, and they also gave very uh, prescriptive ways for the government to deal with wrongdoing, including capital punishment, for certain offenses, but also other kinds of penalties. So the question is, why do we follow some laws and not others? Well, it's because we as believers living uh, on this side of the cross, we are living under a new covenant. We are not living under the Mosaic law um, 
because, um, sorry, Jin, go back to the beginning of this paragraph, okay? So why do we follow some laws and not others? It's because we live in a new covenant brought in by Jesus. Jesus has fulfilled the whole law, but the way that works out is different for each category. So the ceremonial law still exists in theory, but through the blood of Jesus, we are no longer um, sinners before a, a God of judgment. Um, God is still who he is, but we have been made clean by the blood of Jesus. We don't need all those laws to make us clean or, or to present ourselves as clean. We are clean. We don't need a temple anymore in order to meet with God because Jesus himself is our temple. He is the place where heaven and earth come together. He is God and man come together himself. So we don't need a, a, a temple system in order to illustrate that. Um, the law also pointed us for our need to get clean. And when Jesus came, that was entirely fulfilled. He was the ultimate and final sacrifice that cleansed us of all of our sins. As for the civil law, the coming of Jesus completely redefined what the people of God were so that it's no longer defined by a particular state, right? It is defined by those who have been adopted, who have been grafted in through faith in Christ. And that includes people from every tribe and language and nation. And so we don't have an actual Christian nation anymore in order to practice those laws. We have a kingdom that is not of this world that transcends every other nation. Now, as for the moral law, did Jesus somehow remove the need for us to follow the moral law? The, the moral law is what reflects God's heart, right? There, it's what leads us to flourishing as human beings. And the answer is no, Jesus did not abolish the law. In fact, he, he escalates the moral law. He defines righteousness according to the intentions and attitudes of our heart and not just our outward actions. So outward obedience isn't enough. It's, it's about us embracing God's reign over us. We can either embrace it or we can resist it. So those aspects of the law, even today, we follow. So how do we know the difference? How do we know which are moral laws that are continually relevant for us today and which are ceremonial or, or civil laws that <clears throat> are not relevant today? And to answer that, we need to look at how those laws are either carried or changed or dropped in the New Testament. So do we have to keep kosher uh, and follow the Old Testament food laws, right? Well, we don't just eat bacon because it's, it's delicious. We eat bacon because in Acts chapter 11, um, we read that Peter had this encounter where the Lord spoke and he said, don't call what is don't call unclean what I have made clean, right? So all food has been declared ceremonial clean to us. It no longer makes us unclean. In fact, some of those ceremonial laws that serve to keep uh, the Jewish people separate from the other nations, those laws are not only not relevant for us, but if we allowed those laws to continually separate us after Jesus broke down the wall dividing Jew from Gentile, we would be uh, going against God's, God's will for us. Uh, what about judgment and, and putting people to death, right? Because the Old Testament prescribes the death penalty for certain things. Well, those were prerogatives for the nation, for the state of Israel under Mo the covenants of Moses. And in the New Testament, we recognize that um, the death penalty it applies not only to certain laws, but to all sin. And Jesus has taken all the consequences for that on himself. But not only that, Paul says in Romans that we leave, the, uh, we leave justice to God. We don't take vengeance when we are wronged. 
We don't, we don't even judge outsiders, only those who are inside the church. So what about questions of sexual morality? What does the New Testament say? Now, here the, we need to understand that the New Testament is completely unambiguous in condemning all expressions of sexuality outside of a marriage of a man and a woman. Um, and Jesus not only affirms that definition of relationships, but he escalates it and he says, even if you look at someone lustfully, you're guilty of adultery. So <clears throat> without a doubt, all the uh, affirmations in, or all the commands not to engage in homosexuality uh, in the Old Testament are affirmed in the New Testament. Um, sorry, go back, Jaden. Without a doubt, the Old, Testament, Old Testament's prohibition of sexual immorality is still in force and it still carries the penalty of death. But in the New Testament, we also know that that is not the final word. Death is not the final word because Jesus has taken death on himself so that we can be free to live new lives. Every follower of Jesus is offered this new life and the opportunity to live a new way, in a new way, according to God's moral law. And we are accountable for doing that. So if we ever come to the point where we are just picking and choosing what we follow and what we don't, we have to repent. We have to repent because at the heart of it, um, if we're picking and choosing, we are putting our preferences above God's will. We are putting ourselves in the place of God, and that is the very essence of sin. So no, we, we can't just pick and choose. That's, that was the first challenge. Second challenge is this. Uh, the, the claim is this. The New Testament's condemnation against homosexual activity extends to abusive relationships and not loving monogamous covenant marriage. So the evidence uh, cited in support of this is the use of the word that we translate homosexual in the New Testament. And uh, in the original language of 1 Corinthians and, and 1 Timothy, where Paul talks about this issue, he uses the word arsenokoitai. Sorry, arsenokoitai. So the argument is if you look at how this word was used 1700 years ago or 1800 years ago, it would seem that it's not talking about homosexual relationships in general, but rather exploitive relationships, like, like pederasty, which is a sexual relationship between a man and a boy, or male prostitution. And so if Paul is using that word in the first century, um, 2000 years ago, is he actually uh, prohibiting uh, only, or is he prohibiting all homosexual relationships or only those exploitive ones? So how do we answer that question? How do we answer this challenge? Well, first, in order to buy this argument, in order for this argument to be plausible, it would be helpful to have some reference in scripture of any positive committed sexual relationship between members of the same sex. If, if there was any instance where we could say, well, here is an example of an exception, except there aren't any. Um, it, it's, it's an argument from silence actually to say that, uh, that Paul is uh, giving an exception here for uh, uh, monogamous committed relationships because he doesn't actually say that. Um, Matthew Vines, who made this argument popular in uh, his book a few years ago, he, he's not actually a biblical scholar. So this is pretty much just conjecture. Now, I'm not saying that to put him down. I'm just saying, if you actually 
study the language and if you know the text, you'll see that it's not actually that, it's not debated that the Bible is unambiguously against same-sex relationships. Um, Luke Timothy Johnson is a very respected New Testament scholar um, who knows the original languages. He's also a conservative Catholic uh, scholar, except for the fact that he is fully in support of same-sex relationships. So what does he say about what the Bible says uh, regarding same-sex relationships? And this is interesting. He says, I have little patience with efforts to make scripture say something other than what it says through appeals to linguistic or cu cultural sub subtleties. The exegetical situation is straightforward. We know what the text says. But what are we to do with what the text says? We must state our grounds for standing in tension with the clear commands of Scripture and include in those grounds some basis in Scripture itself. I think it important to state clearly that we do in fact reject the straightforward commands of Scripture and an appeal instead to another authority when we declare that same-sex unions can be holy and good. And what exactly is that authority? We appeal explicitly to the weight of our own experience and the experience of thousands of others have, have, and the experience thousands of others have witnessed to, which tells us that to claim our own sexual orientation is in fact to accept the way in which God has created us. By do, so doing, we explicitly reject as well the premises of the scriptural statements condemning homosexuality. So do you get what he's saying here? He's saying, listen, the Bible is not unclear. It's just that we look to our own experience uh, in order to shape our view of, of this issue. So it really is grasping for people to say, well, the Bible doesn't talk about committed uh, loving relationships when it condemns homosexuality. Second, there would have to be evidence that this word arsenokoitai is a word that only refers to explicit, rev, uh, explicit, sorry. Second, there would have to be evidence that this word arsenokoitai is a word that only means exploitive sexual relationships between people of the same sex and not just a catch-all -all term for people who have sex with members of their own sex. Um, it's an interesting claim to make to say that that is the case, especially in light of the fact that it seems that Paul himself invented that word. Now, what do I mean by that? It means that before the Apostle Paul, no one had ever used that word before. And after him, people use it. And over you know the next 300 years, it takes on other specific meanings. But it's not hard for us to know what Paul meant by that word because we can see how it is that he came up with it. See, Paul and Jesus and James and John and Peter and the other writers of the New Testament, they all used the same Old Testament when they were quoting the Old Testament. They all used the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew. And when you look at the Greek Old Testament passages about homosexuality, uh, you can see where Paul came up with that word. Leviticus 18.22 says this, you shall, have, you shall not have sexual intercourse, and, and the word for sexual intercourse there is koitai, with a male, and the word there is arson, as with a woman. It is an abomination. So he takes the word arson, meaning man, and koitai, uh, meaning have sex with, and he's saying this word, Paul is saying, is, is creating this word for men who have sex with men. That is literally what it means, and it doesn't mean anything else. The third thing we need to see here is that it isn't true that the ancients didn't know anything about loving, committed relationships between people of the same sex, right? Vines is saying Paul is only condemning uh, exploitive homosexual relationships because that's all he knew about, but that is, that's not true. People in the ancient world definitely knew about mutual uh, same-sex relationships. Um, 
Several ancient authors talk about the Sacred Band of Thebes, which was a military unit comprised of 150 same-sex couples who were known for fiercely fighting in battle for each other because they were defending their own lovers. Then there's the relationship between Alexander the Great and his general Hephaestus, Hephaestion, sorry. There's in, the, in Homer's Odyssey, there's Achilles and Patroclus. And in some cases, these men had female wives and lovers as well, but it's not ambiguous that they had these sexual relationships with men that they considered to be their equal and, and to be in a mutual relationship. So we can't say that uh, people in the ancient world didn't know anything about mutual loving same-sex relationships. It's simply not true. Tim Keller writes, um, Bernadette Bruton and William Loder, these are scholars, have presented strong evidence that homosexual orientation was well known in antiquity. Aristophanes' speech in Plato's Symposium, for example, tells a story about how Zeus split the original human beings in half, creating both heterosexual and homosexual humans, each of which was seeking to be reunited to lost halves, heterosexuals seeking the opposite sex and homosexuals seeking the same sex. Whether Aristophanes believed this myth literally is not the point. It was an explanation of a phenomenon the ancients could definitely see, that some people are inherently attracted to same sex rather than the opposite sex. Contra Vines and others, the ancients also knew about mutual non-exploitive same sex relationships. In Romans 1, Paul describes homosexuality as men burning with passion for one another. That is mutuality. Such a term could not represent rape, nor prostitution, nor preterasty, as in a man-boy relationship. Paul could have used terms in Romans 1 that specifically designated those practices, but he did not. He categorically condemns all sexual relations between people of the same sex, both men and women. Paul knew about mutual same-sex relationships, and the ancients knew of homosexual orientation. Nevertheless, Loder observes that nothing indicates that Paul is exempting some same-sex intercourse as acceptable. So the argument that Paul couldn't have possibly been talking about uh, loving, covenantal, mutual same-sex relationships in Romans 1 or 1 Corinthians 6 or 1 Timothy 2, it, the argument just doesn't hold any water. The last argument I want to look at is one I've mentioned before, and it's uh, important. I, I want to talk about it again because it has been the starting point for a lot of advocates of affirming same-sex marriage in the church and also because it has been used as a weapon against people who hold it to a traditional definition of marriage. And this is the bad fruit argument. Jesus says in Matthew, 6, Matthew 7, 16, you can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you, produce, can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and is thrown into the fire. So this is the argument. Here, here I've got two premises and a conclusion. Premise one, non-affirmation of gay relationships causes distress to people in gay relationships. Premise two, causing someone distress is bad fruit. Here's the conclusion. People who do not affirm gay relationships are like bad trees that will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. Do you see the implications of this argument? So if if we as a church, or if I as a pastor, do not affirm same-sex relationships, then I am a false teacher, and I will come under the judgment of God. Not only that, the entire church for all of history, up until the 20th century, has been all bad trees producing bad fruit, because up until the 20th century, no one ever affirmed same-sex relationships. That is the implications of this argument. So, is it a valid argument? Well, let's look at the premises. Because if the premises are true, then the conclusion is warranted. 
So premise number one, let's take a look. Non-affirmation of gay relationships causes distress in people who are in gay relationships. What kind of distress? Well, Matthew Vines describes it for us. First, a feeling of rejection by the church and alienation from God. Now, I'm not going to invalidate his experience of uh, re feelings of rejection from the church because I, I honestly believe that we can do better and I believe I can do better um, about not causing people to feel that rejection. But what about alienation from God? Um, I think it's important for us to remember that alienation from God is the starting place for all of us. We are all sinners. And that is something we have to come to grips with, but we also recognize that re the redemption from that state is offered to everyone through Christ. There is no exception clause in the gospel that says the blood of Jesus is not enough for people who have committed homosexual sin. You know what? I believe one of the most powerful lies of the enemy is to convince all of us in our own way that Jesus is not enough for our particular sin, that somehow we are the exception. But that is a lie, right? Satan is called the accuser for a reason because he lies in that way to condemn us of something which Jesus has already forgiven us of. Um, but that lie is on him. It's not on God and it's not on the church either. Second, Vines argues that this distress uh, comes from shutting off the primary avenue for relational joy and companionship in people's lives. So this is what we are doing by not affirming same-sex marriage. Now, I am a married man and I get to enjoy the relational joy and companionship that comes from being married. But does that mean that every person who is single, who does not, who is not in a relationship with someone, is somehow living a truncated life, a life without joy, without companionship? You know, I want to read you a quote from, from Sam Albury uh, a pastor who is same-sex attracted, but is choosing to honor Christ through his singleness. So listen to how he responds to this claim from Matthew Vines. He says, if my sexual feelings are truly who I am at my core, then they must be fulfilled in order for me to even begin to feel complete and whole as a human. My sense of fulfillment is cast upon my sexual fortunes and everything seems to depend on it. But being a Christian gives me a different perspective. My sexual desires are not insignificant. They are deeply personal, but they are not defining or central. And so fulfilling them is not the key to fullness of life. I suspect our culture's near hysterical insist insistence that your sexuality is your identity has far more to do with the prevalence of torment, self-loathing and destruction than we have begun to re realize. Are we really to suppose that only good fruit has come from affirming same-sex relationships or encouraging Christians to self-identify as gay from a young age, or that no spiritual and psychological damage has resulted from this? And are we to suppose that only bad fruit has come from the non-affirming position? What of those of us who experience same-sex attraction and yet are committed to the traditional understanding that the Bible prohibits homosexual behavior? Many of us have found the evangelical church to be a place of open-armed acceptance, support, and encouragement. Scripture to be sometimes hard, but always good. And singleness to be both costly and positive. And Christ to be our fundamental and everlasting joy. You know, I know a lot of people who are, are single, and I know that that is not an easy road for them to walk whether they're same-sex attracted or not. I know a lot of people who are married, and sometimes that is a hard road to walk. And sometimes sexual fulfillment isn't even a part of, that, of the picture um, in those marriages for one reason or another. And, and life in those relationships can be deeply frustrating across the board. And I can see how discouraging 
and frustrating it must feel when you so deeply want a relationship and you don't get to have one. And you see people on the greener side of the grass, right? And you don't, you know that that's never going to be for you. But even though the grass looks greener, I just want you to remember that <clears throat> none of us gets through life without struggle. <clears throat> Sorry. None of us get through life without heartache. The road each of us have been given to walk is never an easy one, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily wrong. And that brings us to premise number two, which is that causing distress is bad fruit. So if this premise is true, what do we do with Jesus? Jesus says in Matthew 18, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into the eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and then be thrown into the fire of hell. Jesus says in Luke 14, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father or mother, your wife and children, your brothers and sisters, yes, your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Jesus says in Revelation 3.19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. See, what every person who will follow after Jesus needs to understand is that our sin nature, what tempts us, what drives us, what promises us joy and life and peace and satisfaction, that nature is at odds with what is ultimately good for us. It is at odds with what God intends for us. And so true repentance, what God requires of us, will not happen without a confrontation between our will and his it doesn't happen without distress but it's not only distress every one of us whatever our situation we have to die to ourselves and turn away for, for, from our sin but every one of us should know that no matter what we turn away from it's it's always worth it we shouldn't be so quick to assume that distress is inherently bad or that it's bad for us or that it's bad fruit. So if that's not bad fruit, what is bad fruit? Well, let's look at, at what that verse actually says in context. Let's look at Matthew seven thirteen. So this warning about bad fruit, it comes in a, in a set along with other warnings that will help us understand what bad fruit is. Matthew 7, 13, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So what's the warning here? It's that if you are on the right path, expect it to be hard. And a lot of people are not going to take it. There's going to be a current of people going the other way, saying, look at this way. It's easier. This is better. This is the, the way you should be going. But that way doesn't lead to life. It leads to destruction. Let's keep reading. Jesus says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, and, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, and thus you will know them by their fruits. So what are the bad trees that bear bad fruit? Well, look at, look at what Jesus says here. False prophets, people who claim to speak for God, who claim to know his will, but, but they don't. They're wolves in sheep, sheep's clothing. They are people who claim to be something they're not, who in fact are using their authority to prey on, on the flock for their own gain. And that gain could be money, it could be power, it could be sex, it could be influence, it could be any of those things. 
but they, they don't bear good fruit. So what is good fruit in scripture? It's important for us to look at this. John the Baptist says fruit uh, talks about bearing fruit in keeping with repentance, right? That turning away from sin and turning toward God. The Apostle Paul talks about what bad fruit and good fruit looks like in Galatians 5. He says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. So what do we do with this argument about bad fruit? Well, I want us to hear Jesus very clear here. Watch out for people who tell you that there's an easier path. They are not leading you to life. Watch out for people who tell you that your sexual desires are who you really are and who tell you that you're not really living and you're not really a whole person unless you embrace them. I want you to hear this. If the spirit is in you, you're not going to go through life without love. You're not going to go through life without joy. The journey of faith isn't an easy road, but the the Spirit will give you the peace you need for the journey. He will give you the patience for the journey. He will bring out in you kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness through your struggle against the flesh. And he will give you the self-control that you need so that you will have the power to say yes to God and no to sin. Understand that biblical faith is not the easier option. You know, if you are struggling with temptation of any kind, you can probably find someone out there who, who interprets the Bible in such a way that you get to do what you want. But those other interpretations, those other options don't lead to life. The way to life is the path of hearing the voice of God in his word and following and the power to walk on that path is given to us. It's promised to us by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, which guides us, which nourishes our souls, which leads us, which comforts us, which corrects us. And, and if some, that sometimes that's hard, Lord. And sometimes it's not what we want to hear. Father, I pray that you'd give us courage and hope to see um, that following you, that surrendering ourselves and saying, not my will, but yours be done. It is, it is always worth it. It is always what will truly bring us life. I pray, Lord, that as we wrestle with scripture, uh, you would also just hold us together in unity, Lord that we build one another up, that we test everything against what your word says and hold on to what is good. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll close with a benediction from 1 Thessalonians 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go in peace.